One of the aspects I really find intriguing is to reflect upon which instruments did Mozart play upon when he was not at home, when he was abroad, when he was in Munich, when he was in Mannheim a few years after Munich. And I know that if I make the case for the clavichord, you typically have a reaction which I can understand that I am advocating for the clavichord really much and that I should be balanced that with the presence of the harpsichord. Okay, I can understand that and the harpsichord was really an instrument that was really present. But the other side is true, is true as well, that if you read on Wikipedia or hey, even in research and in, in, in academic books, anything that's before piano, it's at best indicated with clavier, but often translated in harpsichord and there is no evidence for that. And not to say that proof is really important, but if we are not doing research anymore to the facts and come up with that, what's this historically informed performance practice or whatever you want to call it, what is the reason for its existence? So we have to reflect on that. And the perspective you take is of course important. And so I can understand if I make the case for the clavichord, that's partly because I take the stand, the perspective from what if the clavichord was still much wider spread than people maybe assume. It's kind of acceptance that the clavichord was very much present in the German areas in the second half of the 18th century, maybe less before, but the question if it's that if that was true, you will not find evidence of the non-presence of the clavichord before 1750. And even going to the life of G.S. Bach, it is almost for certain that the clavichord, the unfretted clavichord, played a much bigger role in his life than we today assume. So yes, it's important because the choice of instrument, that's one of the basic elements of the historical informed performance practice. In fact, that's the reason perhaps that people started to that with that movement, so to say, to play music again on early period instruments because the influence on the performance is so big. So yes, it's important to research that aspect very deep. And the, I wouldn't say it's a typical 20, 21st reaction to say what well, it's all the same. They would have accepted everything, but it is more our nature of today to be very forgiving, so to say, in regarding to choices. And our reflection of today to the past is, of course, something we can never, never get rid of. It will be always there. But just taking another perspective makes you see new things. And so that's the only topic of today, Mozart and his instruments in Munich and in Mannheim. The pianoforte, as we know it, the Walters, and they were for much later. He visited to St uh, had a visit in Stein in Augsburg, which he found interesting, but he didn't bring a Stein piano with him. So he only, Mozart would only have in Vienna a pianoforte. So what's the thing before? You had a square piano, which was probably the instrument that came up with the bourgeoisie. So not the, it was a new instrument related to the clavichord maybe, but less. It had more sound, it had more power, not to be compared to our modern pianos, not to be compared with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the piano forte, as we would say later, but certainly more than a clavichord, but a square piano certainly in those days had less um, expression capac capacities as a clavichord is really one-to-one. -one. What you translate into and what you put in the key is being translated into sound within enormous range of dynamic expression. On a square piano, you can play soft and you can play loud, but that's about it. Not saying that it's not beautiful. Again, not diminishing the value of that piano, but that's just the reality. You have more dynamic expression on the clavichord, which makes it also a very difficult instrument to play upon. And so it's very understandable that the square piano, probably at those days, was present in the house of the rich people uh, who had daughters who wanted to play music. So, but what about the clavichord? And I must say that Mozart, if you play his music, <clears throat> I can understand. And I think it's true that Mozart 
is expanding the technical possibilities in a way you are not seeing in the same way with Haydn. Haydn is, in a way, he, he will do it in his latest sonatas, certainly his very latest one, the E-flat major, but Mozart's sooner than Haydn starts to expand the techniques, which for the clavichord still works, but sometimes feels a little bit uneasy. I must admit that. I was reading, and that's my point, I was reading um, the letters of, of Mozart. This is just a, um, a selection of them, the most important translated in Dutch, which for one change is sometime, sometimes handy to read. And I was reading about his stay in Mannheim, so a few years after Munich. And there's a passage about Vogler, so um, the famous player and composer, and we today tend to smile a little bit about him, Abbe Vogler, but he was a really big name at the days. He had a huge position in Mannheim, and he traveled a lot um, throughout whole Europe a little bit later, but Vogler was in Mannheim, in fact, a very popular musician. So Mozart came there and he didn't pay a visit to Vogler, which was a kind of annoying to the great composer, I suppose, because he was very curious to meet Mozart. So there is a beautiful letter to his father, and you know his mother traveled on this trip. And the great thing of that is that we have letters sent to his father speaking from musician to musician. So they, they go more into depth than when these letters would have gone to his mother. So Mozart talks about Vogler, who after a while paid him a visit. So he was very proud that the big Vogler went to his place. So and this describes this very interesting in a way that Vogler was a little bit early and so he, they went upstairs already. And when the guests arrived, they Vogler decided that they would have to play something, but Mozart didn't have a keyboard. So he asked, Vogler asked two of his servants to get two of his keyboards, which were equally tuned in the same pitch. So they went to the house of Vogler, traveled with the instruments through the city, and went upstairs to the first floor, or maybe second floor, I don't know, it's upstairs where they played sonatas together and had sight readings of each other's works. That's also the famous quote of Mozart, where he says that Vogler, he plays um, very bad uh, from sight because he plays a lot, he plays, plays everything too fast. And the great art of playing things à vue, so from sight reading, is that you play the work directly in the right tempo with the, with the with the pianos and the fortes and the juice that it needs. So, and then he had a remark on his awkward fingering on Vogler, which he was uh, criticized for more than only by Mozart. But anyway, I was thinking, reading this, what instruments were they playing on? That can almost only be a clavichord at the time, because that is a transportable instrument that you can ask for bringing it uh, over a longer distance. I mean, I suppose they went by foot or by carriage, I don't know. Carry the instrument upstairs and then play. So it makes sense to assume that there are clavichords. So if that's a clavichord, it's not written expressively in the letters that Vogler only brought clavichords and not harpsichords of piano, but it's written in the letter as if it was the most natural thing to do. So I'm not saying that I know exactly what was avail what was what on which instrument these people were playing on, but if you fill the word clavier with the term with clavichord, it makes sense. It's really natural. There is another passage still in Munich, I believe, where the emperor Mozart plays in a room. It describes that people, of course, are talking and the emperor is coming closer and sitting down at the instrument to listen to his performance. Of course, that can be a harpsichord, that can be a square piano, but I imagine if a musician at the time is playing, asked to play, 
in a room where people are just talking to each other we would never do that today and certainly not if Mozart would be playing but if you would play on a harpsichord that might have been annoying for the people who are talking a clavichord typically will not annoy the people who are talking it's the opposite around so the emperor comes and sit down with the instrument to listen carefully again not saying that it was a clavichord but if you replace again the term clavier with clavichord it makes sense it's not totally absurd so maybe the clavichord was not only the instrument at the private rooms of the great players and composers but was the instrument also where people were judged their playing upon and that brings us to for instance cpe bach who was who's writing about that if you want to judge a performer put him on a clavichord and so why not in this german culture was there a tradition of players who were traveling presenting themselves to put them on a clavichord it was a very uh, high standard of refinement although we find it very uh, absurd that you would have a person like Mozart play in your room and still talking but anyway that's the context of that time I, I guess so anyway I, I hope you like this little um, thought that I wanted to share with you again I'm not the person to point to any source and to prove things but at the other hand we should not um, make everything as relative as we sometimes tend to do today say oh if this if it sounds beautiful of okay that's that's what this is about but the research needs to be done and so yes i'm advocating the clavichord but yes also i believe that the clavichord as an instrument had a um, much higher reach than we today in fact see on our stages so i think the case of the clavichord needs to be made sometimes a little bit stronger so i'm sure you don't mind thank you for watching here if this is your first time here on the channel i'd love to have you subscribed and if you do that we see each other very soon again for other videos bye